Hello, today I'm going to introduce you to the three problems of functionalism. The three problems are one, the problem of inverted qualia, two, the Chinese mind thought experiment, and three, the problem of consciousness, the deep problem of consciousness. Um, just before we get into that, I just briefly want to remind you what the functionalist theory is. The functionalist theory of mind effectively says that a mental state can be described as a function. Functions have inputs, for example, sensory experiences. Um, in mathematics, they have numbers and then they process outputs. So they process things like beliefs and actions, right? So in the last video, we talked about how if you saw an animal, for example, a bear that was coming towards you, that would be the input, the sensory experience of the bear, and the output would be the um, output would be behavior and the belief that a bear is coming towards you and that you should run away. Okay, so that's what functionism claims. Let's get into the three problems. So the problem of inverted qualia is basically a thought experiment which says the following. It's possible to have functional duplication, i.e. people can say the same things and behave in the same ways and their minds can effectively do the same things, but have different qualia, different experiences in the mind. So, for example, let's say most people in the world, when they look at ripe tomatoes, see red, see the colour that we see when we see red. But there's someone in the world who doesn't see red when they see a ripe tomato. They see green. They see the colour that we see when we look at grass. Now, in that case, if that person had been brought up in the same linguistic community as us, that means they've been brought up to call that colour red, they will functionally duplicate everybody else. So when you ask them what colour the tomato is, they'll say red. They'll believe that the tomato that they're looking at is red. But in fact, they'll be seeing what we see when we see grass. They'll be seeing green. The problem for functionalism is that functionalism says that shouldn't happen. If there is functional duplication, there should be experiential duplication. But that's not happening. But what responses can functionalists give to this? There's two responses they've tried. One response to say is, well, this isn't possible, okay? Even though it's conceptually possible, we could imagine it can't actually happen. The problem for those functionalists is that in the 1970s, it's been discovered that there's something called pseudo-normal vision, i.e. there's 14 out of every 10,000 males seem to have colour blindness between red and green to such a degree that they are likely to see the colour green when we see red and red where we see green. And the reason that scientists think this is because when they're looking at the retina, they're looking at the rods and the cones of the retina, and it looks, and effectively it seems, that the rods and cones are acting differently in these individuals. So that argument doesn't work. The second argument that functionalists try, which is probably a little bit better, says something like this. Although on the surface it appears that there's functional duplication between these two people, if we dug a bit deeper and looked at their behaviour, we'd realise there wasn't. So, for example, if someone's looking at a painting and that painting has lots of green in it and perhaps green would work really well in the structure of this painting, they will like it. Whilst the person who sees red when we see green will not like the painting because it will perhaps look a little bit more aggressive and less pleasant to the eye. So the functionists are saying what you'd actually see is non-functional. You wouldn't see duplication there because these people would respond differently to these paintings. Now, that may be true. The problem is when it comes to aesthetic judgments, we can never be sure exactly what it is that's caused those differences in judgment. And the question's still wide open about whether there would therefore be uh, any changes, even if we dug deeper down. So the Chinese mind thought experiment is effectively a 70s version of uh, the idea of a very sophisticated either AI or computer which behaves like a human being but in fact isn't conscious. So the Chinese mind thought experiment asks us to imagine functional duplication without consciousness. So what does that mean? Well imagine you had, and this is possible by the way, imagine you had a very sophisticated robot which looked like a human, uh, had facial gestures, responded to you, you could interview them for example on TV, and that, that computer functionally duplicated a person perfectly. So they'd respond to you, they would look like they're conscious, they would behave like they're conscious, but in fact what would really be going on is there's no consciousness there, there's just computer circuits and lots of electrical activity going on. The Chinese mind thought experiment is a 70s version of that, which basically says something like because there are a billion neurons in your brain, Ned Block asked us to imagine having a billion people in China who are hooked up with two-way radios and they're given kind of satellite uh, um, communication from their government and they basically all plugged in to a, to a robot and they replicate for a short period of time the human uh, 
uh, uh, behaviours and beliefs. Now the claim that Bloch makes is that there would be functional duplication there, but there wouldn't be a Chinese consciousness, right? There wouldn't be one Chinese consciousness. There would just be loads of different people doing stuff. So in effect, what this claims is we can have functional duplication, but without consciousness. So functions are not the same as consciousness. The response to the Ned Block example initially was saying something like, well, this wouldn't really be a very good replication of human behaviour because probably the people of China would behave much more slowly and they would only respond in a much slower way. So they wouldn't really be able to replicate the speed and the style of human behaviour. And Ned Block's response to that is it really doesn't matter. It's not so much the speed or whether they'd have some certain technical problems in doing this. It's the principle. The principle that even if for only five minutes there could be replication of functions and no consciousness would mean that functionalism is wrong. And of course, as we know today, robots are so sophisticated that we effectively have something very close to human functions, but we think, and we, I suppose this is part of debate, that these computers and these robots are not conscious. So that's the response to functionalism. Finally, we have the deep problem of consciousness. Now, the deep problem of consciousness really affects any theory in the philosophy of mind, but it's particularly problematic for physicalist theories. I want to read for you a section of William James's Empirical Psychology in 1890, where he explains this, and then I will kind of comment on it a little bit. William James says, according to the assumption of this book, thoughts accompany the brain's workings, and those thoughts are cognitive realities the whole relation is one which can only write down empirically, confessing that no glimmer of explanation of it is yet in sight. The brains should, that brains should give rise to a knowing consciousness at all. This is the one mystery which returns. No matter of what sort the consciousness and of what sort the knowledge may be, sensations aware of mere qualities involve the mystery as much as thoughts aware of the complex systems involve it. What William James is saying, effectively, and this has been repeated by David Chalmers and by Colin McGinn, is there's a fundamental problem of trying to understand how an organic piece of matter, effectively what we might call a soggy grey organ, the brain up here in your head, how does that produce this amazingly rich uh, experience, this phenomenological experience of qualia, sensations and life? There seems to be a huge leap between that organic thing here in your head and the experiences we have. And um, that mystery is almost impossible, we think, and, and William James is probably right, that we haven't even seen glimmers of answering that question. Now, it's true that it affects dualism also, except dualism makes some allowance for the idea that there are non-physical properties, which, which then makes sense of consciousness. What physicalism can't do is really make that leap and so that's the last and probably the most difficult problem for any physicalist theory, especially functionalism. Mm -hmm.